Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anna Weiss and I'm Associate Dean of Admission and Director of International Recruitment at Hamilton College. I would like to welcome you, welcome, welcome to our session on applying to college in the United States with some advice from international students. I will be the moderator today for a panel discussion and I'm very lucky to share this space with four current international students from Hamilton College who will introduce themselves shortly. Uh, we know that you have many questions regarding the college search and application process, especially with the events impacting our communities around the world. We hope that today's panel will shed some light on the application process and feature some valuable takeaways as you prepare to submit your application to study in the United States. We will start off with introductions of our panelists. As mentioned, my name is Anna Weiss and I am Associate Dean of Admission at Hamilton and Director of International Recruitment. I am going to have our students introduce themselves, starting with Lori. Hi, I'm Lori. I am originally from uh, the south of Hungary. I am a rising junior, and I am majoring in architecture and urban design, which is a self-designed major. And on campus, I lead the Society of Urban Planners and Architects, which is a club that I started, as well as I'm the captain of the um, figure skating team. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Panita. Hi, my name is Panita. I am from Konkan, Thailand. That's where I am now, Ashley. I am a rising junior and I am a psychology major. I was in the wind ensemble and I was part of the main stage production crew. Fantastic, thank you. Niari? Hi, my name is Niari and I'm originally from India, but I moved to the US from high school and um, I'm a rising sophomore and I'm a biochemistry major with a potential minor in math. And um, on campus, I'm involved with the South Asian Student Association and the Quest Scholars Network. Fantastic, and Jelson. Hi everyone, my name is Jelson. Uh, I'm from Beijing, China. I'm currently a rising senior and uh, I'm majoring in the school, concentration of data science. Okay, uh, that's awesome. We, we lost your mic for a minute. Oh, apologize. So uh, I'm a rising senior and I'm, uh, I major in interdisciplinary computational data science. And uh, I have I've participated in intramural volleyball league on campus and also uh, I was a member of the International Students Association. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So um, for today's format, uh, we've prepared a few questions that we want students to discuss that we think might be of interest to you. However, if you have questions that you would like our panelists to answer, please submit them into the chat box on the right side of your screen. We, will, we have an admission officer who is working in the chat box and will be able to answer some admissions related questions, but you will also be able to pass those questions on to our panelists. So if you have questions that you would like them to address, please feel free to submit them into the chat box on the side of your screen. We're gonna get started. So our first question that we want to talk about is how did you first find out about Hamilton? Uh, why did you apply and uh, why did you end up enrolling? Um, Niari, do you wanna start with this one? Yeah, so um, I first found out about Hamilton through QuestBridge because um, I was a QuestBridge scholar during my senior year and um, I applied to Hamilton as a part of the QuestBridge um, application process. And um, I honestly was did not know what type of school I was looking for. So I applied to um, a wide range of schools ranging from, you know, huge schools, uh, huge state schools to small liberal arts colleges like Hamilton. And um, at the end, it was um, a conversation with my interviewer after my acceptance that did it for me because I couldn't visit before um, I enrolled. So um, just the conversation and the passion with which she was talking about Hamilton uh, was the deciding factor, and that's how I um, committed to Hamilton. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason, why don't you um, t take that question? So basically, what uh, I kind of had this experience of, you know, being on Hamilton when, you know, my first time visiting Hamilton was actually during the Thanksgiving break of my uh, uh, senior year, and I really, you know, there's not a lot of students, so I really just look at the campus. But the second time when I visited, uh, Hamilton, which, you know, was after I was uh, admitted, I kind of really had this wholesome experience of, you know, talking to all the students, attending classes and stuff like that. And, you know, that is when I kind of really see how Hamilton stands out from the rest of the Boris colleges that was on my list. And I, you know, I knew, 
I realized that it was very fr- it's a very friendly, caring community and very collaborative, in, you know, opposed to, you know, competitive culture here. So I really like this campus. I really like how student body react to each other. And that's, you know, in the end why I uh, decided to come to Hamilton. Great. And uh, Panita. I first found out about Hamilton in maybe my sophomore or junior year through a college fair like presentation. It was a very general one. They actually showed one of Hamilton's um, older video, international students, some um, videos, and I always, it, I always remembered that one mostly because it had a really nice panoramic shot. But fast forward maybe um, to my senior year when I was really looking seriously into college admissions, I knew I sort of wanted a liberal arts college education, so I was looking into Hamilton College as well as a few other liberal arts colleges and I I um, talked to uh, admissions officers and got a feel for Hamilton and I felt that it was going to be a good fit for me and turns out one of my um, teachers was actually an alumni of Hamilton so I got to know her experience in that matter too and she really helped like cement my decision on going to Hamilton. Fantastic and Lori? I actually found out about Hamilton through um, just an online college search through College Board. They have a search engine and I, I, you know, I put in that I was looking for a small school, a four year school and one that I could afford. Um, so one that would meet 100% of my demonstrated need and uh, Hamilton was on the list and um, it stayed on my list until my senior year. Very good. All right. Um, so I know Panita mentioned really quickly the idea of fit. Um, so who can talk a little bit more about uh, what is fit and how do students consider that when they're trying to build their college list? Uh, Jelson, do you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. I feel like, you know, this is a, like a two way, two way street of, you know, of, you know, uh, perspective students looking at colleges, like maybe, you know, do the process later on of the application process where you actually submitted everything and then the college and look at, you know, all the perspective students. And I've been, you know, kind of on the both end because I used to, you know, be a prospective student, but now I sometimes work as a mission office. But basically the idea is that, you know, especially at Hamilton, I believe, the idea of fit is that we want to make sure that the students will be happy, will be, you know, can strive at this place, not just that we're looking at the uh, students with the highest, you know, not necessarily the highest uh, grades or everything, or, you know, we're looking for the attribute, but we're considering as a whole and then to see if they you know meet themselves here I, I think that's an analogy that you know the prospective students you know right in, uh, high school seniors also should think when uh, considering colleges you know i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend just applying or interest in a school solely because you know has a good ranking or slowly because you know i you know solely because you really like uh, you know, a particular aspect in school, but also considering, you know, a holistic way of seeing, will I, you know, succeed in this school? Will I be happy? And will I, you know, do I see myself as an active member and participate in everything, you know? I think that's the idea in my point of view of being, you know, fit in the school. It's really kind of about imagining yourself in the environment, right? And seeing, would this be the type of place where I would thrive? So it means it's going to be slightly different for everybody. Um, but it is very good advice that you need to try and consider how would you be in that community. And that can be a challenging thing to do oftentimes if you're not able to visit. But hopefully panels like this where you can talk with current students um, can be helpful in helping you to envision that fit for yourself. Um, so we have a question that was submitted, um, which is, uh, is there anything you learned about Hamilton only after you started classes that you wish you had known before enrolling? Um, does somebody want to try and take that question maybe um maybe Lori. yeah um honestly i i've been having a very nice experience with hamilton so probably the only thing that was a really large realization for me was that hamilton was way further from new york city than i thought and honestly i thought it was going to be just like you know a nice like two hour train ride or something like that well it wasn't um so you know you, you kind of have to um uh, i guess it's if you can't visit it's really hard to just get an idea of where a college is located and how close cities are, how close, you know, major um, metropolitan areas are like New York City. Um, but once you kind of, um, you know, look into that a little more, um, 
I don't think that's like a really, really large shock uh, when you get here, but that's what I would say. I think that was probably the one, the one big thing that I, I wish I looked into. Um, I'm still active in, in the local community, so I, I still go to Utica and Clinton a lot. Um, but I think that's important to look at when you're international. So, you know, just kind of getting an, a basic understanding of, you know, the closest mall, let's say, or, um, you know, train station, bus station, anything like that. So for people who are uh, logging in today, how far is New York City? Um, I believe like four hours, maybe about, five. About four, between four and five, depending on which part yeah. of the trying to go to. And same um, to Boston. Right. So we're kind of in a central location. You can see a little bit of our picture in the back here. And we do encourage you to check out a virtual tour if you've not yet had that opportunity. But we are very much in the center of New York, which is a surprisingly large state. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's about four hours then to Boston, to New York City, also to Toronto and Montreal. So that means um, you can do cities for weekend trips, things like that. But generally, we hope that you enjoy nature. Um, so with that said, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, difference between early decision and regular decision. I know this can be confusing to students as those terms don't necessarily uh, correlate with applying to other country or in-country programs. Um, Lori, would you be able to address that question? Yeah, so I did apply early decision. And um, when you're looking at, you know, the website of a college, you're looking for their um, deadlines for admission, you'll see that their regular decision is usually along um, the first week of January, and then they will give you a decision by March or April. Um, uh, but they have an option called early decision or, or early action in some cases, um, which will offer you um, kind of an, an early application opportunity. So you'll be able to submit your uh, materials before, usually before mid-November or uh, sometimes um, early December. And then that college will get back to you with a decision before the end of the year. So I know Hamilton uh, got back to me December 15th. I believe um, that year, uh, the, I guess, well, not tricky, but the, but the thing you have to know about um, early decision is that um, it is a way for you to show your commitment to a college, to show your dedication. And uh, if you are admitted through early decision, you will be required to enroll. Obviously there will be, you know, certain uh, factors that will allow you to opt out. For example, you know, financial aid, uh, and that was something that I was a little bit nervous about, you know, uh, what kind of financial aid package uh, I will receive along with if I get admitted, which I did, thankfully. Um, but honestly, um, you know, me and my family looked through it and it wasn't, it, it was, it was what we expected. So, um, um, so I, I accepted the offer and uh, um, it can, so in general, early a uh, decision can be just a, a great opportunity for you if you have a top choice for colleges and, and you want to let them know that they're your top choice. So, um, so that's if you're thinking, why would I, other than earlier deadlines, um, why would I select that option? So basically what you're doing, as Lori said, is you're telling a college that it's their, your top choice. So you could do that for Hamilton, you could do that for whichever college in the United States is your top choice. And oftentimes there are higher admission rates for students. Um, through early decision rounds. So it is kind of a decision that you have to make with your family, which says, is this for sure my top choice? If so, it can be a great option. If not, you can always apply through the regular decision route, and that's absolutely fine as well. Um, it's important to know, though, what your options are so you can make good decisions when you're navigating your application. So thank you for that. Okay, um, so we have then a question which is submitted from the audience, which is how accessible our um, professors outside of the classroom. Uh, Anita, do you think you can answer that one? Sure. So professors usually have open office hours and they'll usually um, post it in the um, syllabus or in front of their office, but they also have an open door policy, which means that if their door is open, if their office door is open, then usually you can come in and have a chat with them. And um, I've used that policy a lot. I feel like a lot of the professors are very accessible in that regards, even if I feel like I'm bothering them too much, but honestly, it's fine most of the time to 
And um, the, most of the professors also answer your email pretty quickly, um, exceptions being the weekend, but it's the weekend, so that's understandable. So yeah, accessible. Accessible, all right, great. Um, so then let's talk a little bit about um, writing your college essay. I know this causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of students. Um, they're very stressed about writing a college essay. Uh, Niari, can you talk a little bit about the experience of writing a college essay and if you have any advice? Sure. So I think my number one like tip or advice would be um, be yourself. Um, you know, try to um, you know bring yourself onto paper, which I sound, which I know sounds really um, daunting, and um, it was a challenge for me to articulate my thoughts in a you know words that I could actually put on a piece of paper and say this is me on a paper. But um, for me, what helped me was um, talking to uh, my high school mentor and um, some of my other family members because um, they were the ones that I considered really close to me and also my friend, uh, one of my best friends actually, um, because they are, I consider them really close to me. They know me and um, if I would, you know, write something and they would just like make a face while they were reading it, I would know that that does not sound like me. So I definitely need to take it out, put something that's definitely more me. So um, be yourself and, um, don't be afraid to ask for, um, you know, help and assistance um, when you need it, because that college essay is um, so it's it's like you're giving the college admissions a piece of you sort of to look at and like an insight into your life. So you, that's pretty important. And um, you should really put time and energy into writing that. Great advice, absolutely. So take your time, energy, get some opinions from people you trust and you value, um, and make sure it sounds like you. I think that's all really good advice. Another thing that we like to say in the admission office is if we found this essay lying without our name on it in the middle of a hallway, would your teachers and family be able to say, yeah, that sounds like Niari, right? Um, so when you're reading an essay, uh, you should think about would people be able to identify this? Um, uh, and uh, uh, if it didn't have my name on it, and that could be a good way of uh, thinking about um, thinking about your essay. Now we have a couple of follow-up questions on essays. As I said, usually that causes some stress for people. Um, so somebody says, what topic should you definitely leave out of your college essay? Does somebody want to say things that you shouldn't put in your college essay? Go ahead, Jowson. <laughs> I feel like, you know, sometimes it will be a little counterintuitive to like simply mentioning, you know, I guess, sorry, I, I want to put it in, in a more co like a correct way. So basically, it is, you know, like college, college essay is a place where, you know, mission officers don't know about you. So, you know, a lot of times, um, um, try, try to avoid, you know, talk, talking a lot about school or talking a lot about uh, families. But, you know, those if those experiences are related to you, that's fine. But if you put, take it out of you know, make sure to focus a lot about you. Also, you know, some say, oh, some of that, if you don't want your parents to know, the mission officer probably does not want to know either. You know, it's kind of like this thing. That, right. Yeah. So we want to think about who's going to read the essay, which is admission officers. So probably make sure it's something your grandma would be comfortable reading, something like that, usually. Um, you also want to think, as Jocelyn said, it can sometimes be tempting to write about people in the background, things around us. But remember that the focus of the essay should be you and your progression, right? Yeah, I think that's good advice. Also, uh, yeah, sorry. I was gonna add that um, I think just a great advice for when you're thinking about what to write your essays on, um, um, don't be repetitive. So your application is just a very wide range of information about you. Um, so and your essay is a great opportunity for you to just show another side of you to colleges. So I feel, and, and I feel like sometimes people get into uh, their essay and they start writing about stuff that they already have on their resume or activity list that they um, um, submit to a college, or you know, you're going to talk about things that might already be evident from your grades or something like that. Um, so I feel like just make sure that you're using the essay as yet another opportunity for you to introduce yourself and introduce a new side of you and, and a, you know, aspects of your life and just, just don't be repetitive. Good advice. And the, another way you could think about that, in the U.S. we have a saying which says, you miss the forest because of the trees. 
right? So you focus on each individual tree, but you don't see how the overall forest looks. So think about your application in a similar way. Each part of your application should be a tree in the forest, but it should be a comprehensive. You don't want to repeat the experience. Okay, good advice. Um, so let's actually go a little bit more uh, higher level and say, uh, what is the best advice you would have for students applying this year? So I'd like each person to answer this question, what your best piece of advice would be. Uh, let's start with Panita. Um, I feel like even though the circumstances are sort of dire right now, I feel like the colleges, not just Hamilton College, but I hope most colleges in general are very understanding and are willing to help you through this new and strange world and help you with um, any, any um, extraneous circumstances you might have um, due to COVID and everything. And they'll be very understanding and helpful to assist That's you. Great advice, great advice, absolutely. Um, Jocelyn, do you want to offer the advice? Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, a lot of times uh, students would be, you know, prone to, you know, you know, because affected by the people around them or their peers to see, okay, what's everybody applying to or what's my parents feeling about the particular school and applying to, this, you know, those certain set of schools. But again, I want to, you know, I want to reiterate, I think it's pretty obvious, but important that, you uh, a lot of times that you are going to be the one who end up in the school they you know that you go. so definitely put yourself as a priority this is not a time to go see yourself do yourself see if that works for you and i think that's the top priority so yeah not a time to make other people happy kind of a time to focus on you for a bit good advice all right um lori a little bit of you know just going off of justin's point um, and this helped, this helped me kind of think about, you know, how I'm going to get through, uh, quarantine and just, just, the, this year entirely, maybe, um, is to think about, you know, you're not the only one losing chances to visit colleges. You're not the only one who had to, you know, um, be, you know, who, who was let go from a job or something like that. You're not the only one who is now struggling to get the best grades that you know you could be getting if, if you were sitting in that classroom. So when you're, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about how terrifying this is uh, for you, just think about how everyone else is in the same, the same shoes as you. So uh, when, you know, uh, when colleges will receive applications from 2020 and even from, from the years after this, um, they'll be understanding and uh, you won't, you, you should not lose sleep, sleep over uh, just really um, thinking about this. So, you know, just, just give yourself time, take a deep breath, and it will all be fine. Good advice, good advice. And Niari? Uh, for me, I think my advice would be to communicate with the colleges and engage with the college, like even before you apply to it, to um, get a sense of how the college is. And if you even want to apply to that specific college, because I think just by engaging, um, I know with everything going on, it's um, difficult, but I'm just virtually engaging, talking to people, you know, being part of like um, panels or like, you know, just uh, watching videos can give you a good feel of the college and that will help you make a decision before you even apply on, oh, do I want to put my time into this college or um, is this not the right fit for me? I know you also, Nara, you received some pretty memorable advice when you were applying to colleges, right? Can you share that with us? Yes, so uh, my high school mentor um, uh, told me this before uh, my senior year began, and that's something that um, I've taken forward with me through everything. And it's just um, that you may not end up going to college where you think you want to, but you will end up going to college where you are meant to be. Absolutely, so understanding that things work out the way they do, and sometimes there's just a little bit of fate involved. I think that's great, that's wonderful. Um, so I know another thing that causes a lot of people stress um, and was referenced a little bit earlier is the idea of financial aid. It's oftentimes expensive to come study in the U.S. and that can be a very daunting prospect. Now, if you go online, Hamilton has a pretty high price tag. So I think students would be interested in knowing um, should they not apply to Hamilton because of the high price tag? Uh, Lori, would you be able to talk about this? I don't think that should be the primary factor that you think of when you're applying to colleges. I know that sounds 
a little bit pretentious. I am definitely from a background where I could not afford Hamilton. <laughs> um, and um, so I was, you know, I, I talked about using a search engine to find colleges. And, and my first my first filter that I put on that search engine was can I meet 100% of demonstrated need? Because uh, I needed to be sure, you know, that I'm not looking at a college and then I'm applying and it turns out that they cannot support me, you know, coming to that college and just and and then affording it. Um, so it's just again we we've talked a lot about com how communication is really important. So I'm really encouraging everyone that I talk to. You know, when you're looking uh, at colleges and you you see these buzzwords, you know, about financial aid, make sure that you you actually go on their website, you actually check uh, it out, see what that means. Uh, I believe every single college has uh, uh, one of those calculators that will tell you uh, how much you could be expecting to contribute. Um, and then, you know, email financial aid, uh, get in contact with them, uh, let them know about your situation. Um, and just to use uh, my example, after my first year at Hamilton, I decided to become financially independent from my parents. And uh, I showed up to, I know this is not necessarily, you know, applicable to most of your situations, but I went into the financial aid office and I uh, told them that, and I told them that uh, from now on, I'm, I'm, I'll be working, you know, extra hours to make up for uh, the money that my parents are supposed to pay into my tuition. Um, and they were very understanding. They, um, you know, they kind of um, put a note that says, you know, like I'm not in, in the future, like they shouldn't necessarily expect me to ask my parents for financial help. Uh, and so they were really accommodating with that. And I think that's just super important if you're in a situation, you know, uh, you know what you need to do, just let them know. I also had a friend who moved uh, here from Florida and um, so she had like zero winter clothing. And um, when she was in need of that, she just went to the financial aid office and talked to them and they got her like a really nice pair of boots because um, they recognized that, you know, she couldn't afford it. And then uh, she just did not own an item like that. So it's, uh, I know it can be like very stressful and this is probably like the, the biggest stress in applying for many of you. Uh, you know, just getting accepted is awesome, but then, you know, getting an award letter that just really, really ruins the whole picture is, is one of the worst feelings that you can experience. But I really hope that you guys reach out to these offices, uh, you know, kind of just let them know and 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 make sure that, that they're looking out for you in this aspect. Absolutely. And that's um, really great advice to know that you can interact with these offices and that they are there to help you and really support you. And that's something hopefully um, you will all experience as you begin to navigate this application to Hamilton College. Um, and as Lori mentioned, um, financial aid information, we have some of that information on the website as well. If you apply for financial aid at the same time as you receive your admission letter, you'll also receive your financial aid letter at that time. You'll have both of the important pieces of information uh, in order to be certain whether uh, Hamilton would be the best option for you. As we also mentioned, if you do apply early decision, if for whatever reason your financial aid package is not what you expect it to be, uh, that would be a reason why you would be released from the binding uh, decision if we can't come to an agreement on financial aid. But otherwise, um, you should have all of the financial aid information available uh, with you uh, before you need to make the confirmation decision. Um, and it's important to know that Hamilton uses its resources in order to ensure that a Hamilton education would be affordable to students from around the world. Okay, um, so we had a question, uh, several questions that are submitted um, uh, earlier. So uh, let's see, uh, somebody wants to know, did you feel welcomed when you first arrived at Hamilton? And I think that somebody also has asked about, is there a sense of community since the school size is pretty small? These seem kind of similar. So um, can we talk about community and how you felt, whether you felt welcomed or not when you first uh, started on campus? Somebody wanna take this one? Jason, great. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just wanna iterate that to all, all of our audiences that you know we are 100% residential uh, college, which means that everybody lives on campus and all, everything goes on on campus. Uh, you know, you, you understand this, but when you get to Hamilton, uh, your email inbox will be filled with a lot of different, you know, because we have over 200 organizations and clubs and all of them are trying to host events and everything. So you, you have too much to, you know, too much on your plate that you can actually go. So, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, 
you know, there's a movie being happening, but also the culinary society is going to, you know, to go and try to eat stuff like that. So it, it's, it is definitely, you know, the community is definitely, definitely very engaging, and then, you know, everybody's on campus with a lot of, you know, naturally with their friends, out. There's a lot of different activities and stuff like that. So you know, it's, it's definitely a, a very, you know, a close knit campus, I would say. Um, but also, I remember when I first got here, actually, the college was uh, to uh, pick us up from the Syracuse airport. So there's a couple of national students. Uh, at the airport. Basically, we started abundant right off the bat because it was very nice. Uh, and when we got here, you know, we were greeted by the staff members, and then we were going into to the uh, orientation right away. So, you know, in that kind of process, you know, it, it puts into a setting where you really, you know, on and communicate with those people on your orientation trip that you wouldn't normally do on a regular basis. But those people are the first ones that you get to know. And then later on, you know, a lot of us stay at friends and meet up together, you know, every semester for something fun. So that's kind of like, you know, our school have all these mechanisms and systems designed to make sure that, you know, you are welcome that you make friends. But in general, I feel like international students are very welcome on campus because, you know, we use the overall diversity and also, you know, because we come from a different background, have our different stories, so, you know, it's definitely there. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, so that is part of the orientation trips that we do. So in traditional times, when you come to campus, you start on an orientation adventure trip where you would go with a small group of students, either out into the community or out into the wilderness, right? Niari is smiling, seems like that's a pretty memorable experience. Um, so, uh, and the idea behind that experience is that it helps you to form a cohort and to connect with students before you even arrive on campus. And it's helpful then to have a few people that you know as you navigate the orientation in the beginning of your college experience. It's also important, as Jowson said, and Lori said, we're 100% we're residential on campus, and we ensure that all first year students live in the same residence halls together with other first year students. So you're experiencing um, your first year along with other students who have that same um, current situation, right? So it is helpful because it, you all have at least something in common, which is we're all, uh, likely far from home or in a new uh, campus environment. And it really helps to form that community that's so important to everything we do here. Um, okay, so let's ask um, a question then um, about engaging with colleges when you're applying. Now, um, this is a little harder this year probably than a lot of other years just because of um, all of the things that are going on around the world. But it is important to know that colleges have provided lots of opportunities for students to engage with us virtually. For instance, at Hamilton, we're doing virtual events such as this one. Thank you for joining us. Virtual tours, we've got video tours, we've got chats, information se uh, sessions. You can do virtual interviews online. All of those are available right now on our hamilton.edu slash um, discover page. Um, but I'm interested if you could talk about um, how you engaged with a college before applying. Uh, Panita, would you be able to tell us some about your experience? Yeah, so prior to applying, I was not able to visit the, camp the campus on the accounts of the Pacific Ocean, but I was able to find a lot of virtual like um, activities and I read online about the college. I went to college fairs whenever I could. And once I think I actually made a beeline for the Hamilton booth. So uh, that was when I was very interested in Hamilton. And you get to talk to the admissions officers and you, sh you will get their contact, you get their contact information and send an email after that. That's usually a really great way of engaging with the admissions officers. You, I was going to set up an interview, but I forgot. Um, but you should do an interview is, if possible, because bef before COVID, that was probably one of the best uh, virtual forms of engagement um, if you were unable to be on campus. But with COVID, um, everything is mostly virtual now. And I feel like for international students especially, it might be a bit easier to engage um, because you don't have to be physically there like this one. So that is a, that's a good point with the overall virtual uh, landscape out there. There might be more opportunities, particularly for international students who might be, uh, you know, uh, prevented from traveling by that pesky ocean situation. Um, uh, uh, so absolutely, if you'd be interested in scheduling things like interviews, those are all available on the website. You can do that uh, 
directly following this panel if you want it. Okay, um, so let's talk then a little bit about um, the hardest part of the application process, right? So applying to college overall is a pretty overwhelming thing before you start. I'm sure we can all agree with that. It's uh, stressful in certain senses. I'm interested if you can talk about what you thought the biggest challenge was and how did you um, overcome that? I'd love if everyone would be able to answer this question. Um, Niari, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. So I think the hardest part throughout the college application process for me was deadlines and keeping track of where I send what documents and what else I need to send. Because um, there's application checklist. Um, once you know you send your application, um, you get your portal and there's that checklist, but I can't have like, 10 to 15 tabs open on my computer and like try to navigate what was going on. That was just getting too overwhelming for me. So what I did, I took a huge sheet of paper. I made boxes for every single college I was applying to. And um, I, I wrote down every single thing I needed to do for that college and made a little box. And then once I did it, I just checked it off because sometimes, you know, you've sent the documents, but the college still hasn't, you know, um, gone to processing them. So it may have a delay showing up on your um, portal. So I think just like having that like mass master spreadsheet, like even just having it virtually on your computer on like maybe Google Sheets, um, that would be really helpful. And that's how I, um, you know, uh, dealt with this huge thing that I had to do with sending documents within like a month. Yeah. So I, Good, good advice. So keeping everything organized on your part and realizing that sometimes it takes a little time for admission officers to process your documents. So you don't freak out because you already have your checklist, which says, I know I sent this stuff. Good advice. All right. Um, so uh, Lori, do you want to uh, talk about what you thought was the most challenging part of the application? Yeah. So I feel like when you're an international student, it's not just you applying to college, it's your whole family applying to college because everybody will know about it. And um, uh, you know, sometimes you might be coming from a background where you're the only English speaker in your home or you're the first person to go abroad or try to go abroad uh, for education uh, from your family. And um, uh, for me, it was really difficult to kind of just like, um, well, translate, but then also just kind of like double translate everything to my family for them to understand. And then also... Uh, you know, just like uh, kind of explain what everything meant uh, so that they were up to date and they they knew what I was up to, what was happening. So um, we would usually have these like meetings every other week, I think, where we just like sat down and I was like, okay, this is what's happening. These are the colleges on my list currently. Uh, they are asking for these documents. So right now I'm working on an essay and I'm, I asked one of my professors for, you know, a uh, um, uh, a reference uh, letter and and just you know, kind of uh, kind of uh, making sure that your family knows what's up and knows what's happening to you so that you know uh, when you're having a culture shock with things they was, they're not having a larger one um, but yes so, so that can I think if you do these small meetings like my family did those can help a lot and just you know help with transparency fantastic uh, Panita so I actually had a similar problem to Niari, where I just had um, a lot of like, uh, what do you call it, applications, and I, I am not a very organized person, I will tell you. So I really had to get myself into shape and like put things um, where they should be to get myself through like having multiple applications to different colleges and like different things too, like the visa process, which also was a lot of um, stress. And also I would like to talk about stress. It's a lot kind of stressful having like doing like so much things. And I would just say, just take a break every once in a while, please. Be a human being. Absolutely. Yeah. Realize that human beings need breaks and we're all human here. So, um, and Justin. Actually, I would say the hardest part, as we you know, as a subject we previously discussed a little bit, is actually about you know writing the essays. Yeah, you know, personally, you know, because you know, there's a general essay, but you know, just like Hamilton, we did, we do. Sometimes there's an optional supplement essay as well during the application process. You know, there's a lot of times that you know you can write about so much, so many things uh, about yourself, and you want to present them all, but sadly, the word count is there, and then you can only talk about so much. So, picking the right subject that could demonstrate the most out of the officers on the other end could 
feed the application. I think it's a hard process for me. I, you know, I kind of had to like really dig deep back in, you know, <laughs> back in the days. And it's, yeah, I think that was pretty hard. But again, you know, once you, once you get a hang of it, it's, uh, you know, right now thinking back, you know, it wasn't that hard. To mm -hmm. college, but at the point, it was very daunting. So just, just follow through with that. Just put through and then, yeah, it'll be fun. All right, good advice. Um, so I know we are um, we have a lot of questions that are being submitted. So I'd like to talk about a couple of the ones that are again about community. So we have questions about what do you do for fun? Talk about international cultural events on campus. Have we been able to culturally contribute to campus? So really people are interested in knowing about what is the international student experience on campus? Um, and do you find it a diverse place that you've been able to share your culture? Somebody wanna talk about these types of questions? I, it's like, I, can, I can go. Um, so basically, uh, you know, I've been have spent three years at Hamilton. In general, I would say, um, you know, I, I feel like the question is kind of, you know, putting us as a, you know, separate identity, uh, aside from being a Hamilton students, I would like to point out that at Hamilton, you know, we come from different, all different places. Students come from all over the United States, and then we have international students from 49 different countries. Uh, there's not really much of a, like, people won't perceive you as, an like, for instance, people look at me, they won't perceive you as an international coming from China. They'll just see you as a part of the Hamilton community. So you are allowed and actually do contribute in whatever, you know, in whatever area, you know, that we are interested. You know, for example, I know international students who, you know, serve as, you know, some of the judicial board or honor board, but also some other international students who are actually, you know, involved in a lot of different Peers activities and stuff like that. It's just whatever you want to make it possible to your experience. And uh, I would say also we have this, you know, international cultural fair uh, each year that's, you know, hosted and organized by the International Students Association. So basically what we have is we kind of have this week going, week long thing that would, you know, help, you know, us to kind of like kind of a little bit publicize or advertise our, you know, our culture and our, you know, our country, the you know, campus community, you know, with different kinds of activities, different, you know, panels, and, you know, we have this great food event, too, that students, if you're interested, you can participate to, you know, to try to make some of the food, that, you know, of resemblance of home, and, you know, bring it to the, uh, kind of like this fair, and then so all the students could try out. So, you know, these are kind of the stuff we're actually engaged, and also, uh, we have this kind of very unique kind of some sort of an editorial type style. So basically we'll put these little posters in the dining hall that, you know, invites national students to write about their experiences and, and you know, and talk about a little, a little bit about yourself and your history and stuff like that. So that's very interesting as well. But basically in general, we contribute just like any other Hamilton students, but also there are events that, you know, we can showcase our kind of like where, where we're from, our route. So yeah. Okay, um, so somebody mentioned earlier a question about coming from warm climates, and I know several of um, several of you are in warm climates, particularly looking at Panita. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience um, coming to Hamilton, transitioning to winter? If a question has been at, asked. Um, I will say that it was kind of like shocking. I I have never seen snow before coming to Hamilton. So it was like a real shock. But I feel like if you just wear your coat outside, wear your boots, wear some gloves, you'll be fine. I did not do that sometimes, and that was bad, and I have since learned that. We like to joke in the admission office that there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, right? So um, with different levels of weather, different levels of clothing are required. But it is definitely an experience where if you have not seen snow before, you will see snow at Hamilton. I can promise you that. Um, okay. Yeah. I was just, <laughs> I was just going to add a little bit onto that. People told me before uh, coming, you know, sometimes when you're an international student, you have that very limited, uh, you know, like luggage that you can bring with yourself. So don't necessarily worry about winter clothing at first. Um, people have been buying winter clothing here for centuries so they will have anything that you need available here um, and um, a big thing uh, that 
uh, you should probably keep in mind when coming to Hamilton is that layers are magic. So you don't necessarily need like the thickest winter coat. Um, sometimes uh, I, I know I think this past winter I went through it without actually using my winter coat and just like being mindful of my layers. Oh, Anna's, Anna's disapproving. Um, <laughs> a lot of a lot of people told me to get it. My mom told me to to get my winter coat. Um, but I was fine with my with my fall coat and just um, you know several layers underneath. Okay, um, so we have uh, it's good. Ad I would I was gonna say good advice, but I don't know if I agree. Um, I think you should wear your winter coat. But it's everybody does their own thing. We're all human. We're all grown up <laughs> here. It's fine. Um, I'm team winter coat personally, but that's fine. Um, okay, so um, somebody has asked, um, what did you find very special about Hamilton? after you arrived, I suppose, um, that made you feel like it was the right decision to attend Hamilton? Somebody wanna answer that question? Um, I can go ahead and say what made me feel really um, special. Uh, I think um, it was um, during office hours with uh, during a conversation with one of my professors where, um, so uh, my professor made us like, you know, fill out like a questionnaire. Or, What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite book? You know, what are you planning to study sort of thing? And by the next day, he knew every single person in class by their names. And it was like a 40 person class. So that was huge. Like he called on me by my name. And then when I went to his office hours in the first week of classes, um, uh, I just had like a two minute question, but like while I was walking out, he, we started talking about my favorite movie. Like he said that, oh, that's your favorite movie. That's mine too. And I didn't really expect him to know that movie because it was a Bollywood movie, but uh, just like, just, uh, he just randomly started that conversation and then I was in his office for like almost an hour talking about the movie and analyzing the movie and how it's a great movie. So I think that's what, um, you know, did it for me and made me feel really special about um, the whole experience. The fact that your professor, um, you know, knows your favorite movie, knows your name by the second day of class and just has this really personal connection with you. So th that was really special. Absolutely. Absolutely. It uh, looks like we're, Panita's coming back, so we might have some connectivity issues, but she'll be back in just a minute. Um, so um, we have a question that was submitted, which I'm going to go ahead and answer, uh, which says, if my high school's employees are not fluent in English, how can they engage with uh, Hamilton? Um, so we do have quite a few uh, counselors who will actually write uh, letters of recommendation in native languages, and then do, say, either through a translation service or even through something like Google Translate. We'll translate that document into English. And they'll put at the top of the essay the uh, letter that says this was written in the native language and translated. Um, and when things like that happen, it's absolutely fine for the admissions process. Um, so a lot of uh, counselors will use translation services to help them submit documentation. Um, it should be pretty accessible, but I, I wouldn't worry about this. Admission officers are not going to uh, hold something against you if a counselor has a letter of recommendation which has been put through Google Translate. Something like that is fine for us, not something you should be concerned about. Um, okay, so I wanna uh, pivot and I wanna talk a little bit about the COVID-19 outbreak, right? Um, so we all know that this is something that's affected all of us in different ways and is affecting students who are applying this year. So I'm wondering if you can share a little bit of your experience um, of being a student in the COVID-19 outbreak um, and what was Hamilton able to do or not do in order to support you? But I'd like if everyone be able to address this question. Um, so, uh, Lori, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it kind of hit everybody by surprise what was happening. And um, uh, Hamilton actually was planning on staying open for a long time. So they were hopeful that we could do that. And um, um, I believe the day before uh, we were supposed to leave for spring break, the college decided that we we're going to take a longer uh, break than usual and then start kind of, um, uh, we will resume classes online and, and see how we can return. Uh, the day after that, um, they kind of just put all members of the administration in this one big room and they made sure that um, everyone could return home safe. Uh, you know, there, you know, we were worried that um, airports will close and, and, um, and that, you know, um, uh, just immigration 
um, services will change as uh, people are trying to return home for for spring break or you know maybe even the rest of the semester we really didn't know at that uh, point so they made sure that whoever uh, could return home did and um, uh, essentially their metric was finding the safest place for every single student so if you know in your case uh, staying on campus was your safest option uh, which I know was true for many students from China and many students from Italy uh, they, you know, kind of make made sure that happened, uh, and um, so that that was, I know that was the case for me and Jason as well. But he can talk more about that. Um, and we stayed on campus. We have been ever since. And just um, in my opinion, they really made sure to like keep us um, uh, keep us um, uh, active while we were in quarantine. Uh, there was uh, they they designed a lot of activities, a lot of um, uh, events for us while in quarantine that we could do online uh, and uh, you know they encouraged kind of just like exploring campus more like walking around a little bit uh, even though you know it was it was uh, um, very empty but so in general I, I did feel very supported when uh, when we were uh, in quarantine and um, they they actually put in a liaison system um, so uh, every single one of us had uh, two administrators slash professors who would reach out to us every single week and, uh, you know, maybe get on a Zoom call with us, make sure everything was going on right. But I know that a lot of other um, professors also reached out to students. Uh, me, for example, uh, they definitely did just to make sure that everything was okay, you know, ask us where we are, uh, what our situation is. So um, I think I think we definitely had a very nice, just like supportive network for that. Thank you, thank you. Jowson, uh, do you think you can um, take this one? Yeah, so basically, uh, I will come back when you're done. <laughs> so basically, uh, uh, I had a similar experience arriving back in Hamilton, but also I would like to highlight my experience uh, coming back here. So I was actually studying abroad in Mexico, and I'm uh, coming through the border. So, you know, naturally, they're you know, giving me a little bit hard time. So it was at around you know, three o'clock in the morning, but basically what happened was uh, my, um, so they have to call the, uh, you know, the school administrator or the dean, Alan Harrison, who was in charge of international students traveling and everything. Uh, you know, I just want to, you know, again, so we really try to make sure we support international students. For example, it was three o'clock, the Harrison was on the phone with the, uh, with the, you know, the uh, ICE agents, um, you know, there for like around, uh, an hour or so so you know that was you know really helpful but also you know again that's how much we <laughs> will go and help international students and then you know i arrive on campus and everything was just like laurie said it was you know a great experience and the school didn't even uh, decide to charge us at all it was saying that it's hard enough for international students we'll make it like free for you guys to stay here so it was a very like rewarding experience a scary experience so Justin having been studying abroad in Mexico being detained at 3 a.m and then uh, luckily Dean Harrison was able to help in that situation but that's a scary added level all right um Panita do you want to talk a little bit about your experience because I know you were one of the students who was able to return home right oh yeah so um, we, just, you, I would... uh, we lost you at the beginning we're talking about what happened oh, when yeah. people went online so I was on college when the news broke out. Um, I, I did have to go back home and I, I will say that Hamilton College is very helpful with assisting me in that process. Um, they basically set up like a whole cent like makeshift center where they helped basically every student that had financial needs and problems. And basically they had anyone who had to get like a really big plane ticket home out of no out of the blue, which was me included. And they really helped me um, with that process, um, helped me financially get that ticket because I would not have been able to afford it otherwise, uh, especially like a sudden ticket like that. And they were, and post all of this happening, they also helped um, pack up the dorm rooms and they just recently sent an email about um, bringing those, uh, your belongings back to the dorm rooms. And I felt like they've been really helpful about the suddenness of COVID and helped us like pick up the pieces basically. Thank you. And uh, Niari. 
Yeah, so my experience was definitely like a really different from all of the others because um, I in in like the situation I came back to my uncle's house in New Jersey, um, where you know I stayed for high school. So um, that was um, not that inconvenient for me. But at the same time, you know, with transitioning to online classes, um, my professors were super helpful. They, you know, had open Zoom office hours, which was really nice as a replacement for like normal office hours. Um, they kept in mind that, you know, for a lot of people, a 9 a.m. class in Eastern Standard Time would be a 6 a.m. or like a 5 a.m. from somebody for somebody who's um, on the different side of the United States. And that was totally fine. They were really accommodating with time zone differences. Uh, especially like even with international students engaging virtually. Um, I knew some of my peers who were, um, you know, in China sitting at 3 a.m. in the morning engaging like in office hours and, you know, us having a nice conversation. So the professors were really accommodating with, um, you know, any type of difficult, like not just time zones, but, you know, pushing some of the deadlines for you because you may not have reliable internet where you are, or, you know, you have some um, family things that you need to take care of. So just them being there and just very receptive to what you wanted to say uh, made the transition to virtual um, college really easy. Fantastic. So I think I think we have time for uh, one last question, um, which I'm going to take a question from the audience, which is, um, as an international student, do you sometimes think it's overwhelming to uh, strike a balance between your studies and club activities or extracurricular activities? Somebody want to talk about balancing those two things? And was that challenging? How does that go? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 you can go. <laughs> So I, you know, at first when I came to Hamilton, I kind of did the math, you know, because I like to kind of plan out everything. So basically, if you think about it, you're taking four courses that, you know, meets around, you know, three hours, three hours every week. And by standard, I'm assuming that everybody's spending time to study. They spend twice as much time off class to study, right? And then, you know, after that, you know, if you do the math, you're left with, Daily, you know, aside from sleeping for you know, 10 or 12, resting for 12 hours, you're left with at least six hours of free time to do whatever you want. So if you really, you know, if you really, you know, figure this out, if you really time yourself wisely and, you know, plan everything out ahead of time, you actually have a lot of free time at your end. You know, six hours every day, that's, you know, that's basically at your disposal that you could, you know, maybe do some sports, maybe go to the gym, maybe go on a run, but also, you know, you can participate in those activities and, you know, these club meetings usually runs around half an hour or an hour or for any other events. So I would say uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's overwhelming to keep track of everything that's going on on campus. Also, you know, given the fact that I work on campus as well, it's just more about finding the balance. Maybe, you know, this semester you're taking heavy course load, taking, you know, three courses that require a lot of time for you to think and figure out of your life. And you probably want to dial back a little bit on the uh, activities, you know, maybe serving as, you know, you used to serve as a leadership, you know, member in one of the clubs, and maybe this year you want to play more of a supportive role in this kind of atmosphere. So I think that's the general approach I would take. And uh, definitely there's a lot going on, but I, I, I never felt overwhelmed. Great advice. So kind of starting with uh, more widespread involvement earlier on and then narrowing your focus as you find really where your passions are. Uh, Niari, you wanted to add. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, just like supporting everything that Jowson said. And just like for me, I think Google Calendar was my best friend when it came to managing everything that I was doing. Um, I had all my classes, uh, you know, in I had office hour, like I had I color coded everything. So that was the whole thing. And so I had uh you know, reminders that for 10 minutes before something was supposed to happen. So I knew where I needed to be. And I had a program to give me notifications on my laptop and my phone. So that was how I stayed on top of things. And um, I think just Hamilton students in general tend to do a lot, which is great. Everybody's really involved. Everybody wants to be busy all the time. But the key to that is also knowing that you will miss out on certain things and that's okay. You know, you might miss out on one club meeting to go to another event, or you might have to miss out on something to go to office hours for a question that you really need help with. 
And, you know, that's okay because you're going to get so many more opportunities. There's always something going on. So there's always going to be something that you you feel like you're missing. But at the same time, you're getting so much out of the Hamilton experience in general mm -hmm. that you don't really, you know, focus on the fact that you missed out on any event. Absolutely. So making sure that you're on top of your own organizational structure, making sure also that you're aware of everything and reasonably, you're not going to be able to go to everything. So prioritizing where your interests. And I think that's also a great point um, to end on. So I want to say uh, thank you all uh, so much for submitting some great questions. Unfortunately, we're not able to get to all of them, but that is all the time that we have for today. I do want to say thank you, thank you again to each of our student panelists for participating. I, uh, I think this was a really, really interesting conversation, and I know um, I hope that this will be helpful as you consider navigating your college application process. Um, now, I also want to, of course, say thank you for taking time out of your day um, to talk with us. We understand that there's a lot of anxiety going on around the world right now, particularly applying to colleges. So we want to make sure that we are as approachable as possible. So if you have questions, don't feel like this is ending our conversation here. Definitely reach out to us. Also, if you'd like to potentially uh, send, have an email chain with any current students, you can reach out to us through admission at hamilton.edu, and we can connect you with a student who'll be able to talk to you and answer some of your questions individually. But I do hope that you enjoyed our discussion. And if you would like to find other ways to stay connected with us uh, through various virtual offerings that the Office of Admission is undertaking, please consider visiting hamilton.edu slash discover. We're going to be updating that page regularly with new content and information. So even if you found out about this panel through that page, don't think I never have to go there anymore because we are going to be updating it with more information as time continues. But we want to say thank you. Thank you again. And we wish you a great day or great night, depending on where you're calling in from around the world. Thank you. Thank you.